Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again. Another Monday, another episode. You know who the episode's brought to you by. It's brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I recommend that you go to blackriflecoffee.com and check out what they have. I'm surfing their webpage right now as I speak to you. And the first thing that I saw is they're still promoting the return of the Article 15 limited release apparel, which I talked about on the last episode. I think. If I didn't, I should have, but I'm pretty sure I did. Beyond that, I mean, scroll down a little bit and just go to town with coffee that you might like. Five Alarm, CAF, which stands for caffeinated as fuck, Just Black, Thin Blue Line, Coffee or Die. Holy cow, this thing just goes on. Organic, decaf for people, I guess, that hate themselves. You know where I'm going. Then there's bundles where you could combine cups and coffee and all sorts of things. There's apparently a new game set, new releases when it comes to apparel. I mean, just spend some time. Go to town and support a brand that I love. I love their coffee. I'm obviously deeply invested, opening up a Black Ruffle Coffee here in Kalispell with my business partner. So we're all in. And I think you should be all in as well. I love the brand. love the people behind it. And that is all on the business side of the house. My guest today, one of my absolute favorite guests in people on the face of the planet, Mike Glover. If you've listened to the podcast, you've probably heard an episode between he and I. He did some time in the Army, did some things, uh, and then did some time for some alphabet soup agencies, did some things, got out, founded Fieldcraft Survival. Actually, I think he did that while he was still contracting, regardless. Um, Quite the entrepreneur, among many other things. He teaches shooting instruction, himself, pistol, rifle. Uh, He's got his fingers in a lot of things, and I love doing stuff with him. So, episode... 244 with Mike Glover. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. So, before we started, you claimed that this might be the best episode that we ever do. So I, I don't know what you want to talk about. I thought, though, we could open up with just a, like a smooth, easy, soft topic to just roll people in. Yeah. The Texas shooting. Oh, God. <laughs> That's how it's going to be the most popular because it's most controversial, I guess, in my world recently. What's controversial about that? I came out I came out in... Um, I saw the video. Yeah, immediately came out with no hesitation. This is how it actually went down. John, who's in the room... Uh, my, my head of media for Phil Kraft. He's your quant. You're my quant. He's your quant. <laughs> quant? What's that word? Quantitative. You guys do oh. my math. <laughs> Would God. you call me? <laughs> Quantitative. Your quant. Yeah. Um, Square root of 457,000 is? 1733. Yeah, there you go. That's why you're my quant. <laughs> um, I... I got. I saw that video and I saw it trickling, but it didn't get released yet. And I called John. I said, "Bro, come You're in." You're talking about the security camera. The security camera yeah. footage down the long hallway. Yeah, because there were there were like snippets coming out, but the actual video dropped. And I'm like, "John, get your stuff ready tomorrow morning. We're coming in. And we're talking about it." And I didn't know the right tactics in doing this because I'd never done it on this scale with something so significant. So John recommended like, "Hey, we need to do it minute by minute, and or, uh, technically second by second. And that sucked, because it, it, um, in fact we intentionally cut the audio first because when the gunman goes into the school at eleven thirty three, when he makes entry uh, after he shoots at a couple of funeral directors or, or people who worked at the funeral home, was that adjacent to the school? It was. It was adjacent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was. So it wasn't across the. People think it's across the highway. It was actually adjacent to it. Um, so you just go across a drive and then a lawn and you're on you're in school grounds or in the school actually because the, the lawn is the school grounds um, the audio was one of the main reasons the family didn't want it released the family part of the family didn't want it released so the district attorney of Uvalde was like we're not releasing it and then there was a controversy around that because we're like a lot of people were like well what happened we need to know and whether that's curiosity or people generally wanted to know what happened um, hearing those gunshots, especially in the initial onslaught of him entering room 111, uh, which was the joint to 112, was very difficult to listen to because every one of those shots was a child dying. 
And having now been told very intimate details of what took place in that classroom, which I won't repeat, it's it was disgusting. What was the cadence between the shots? It was he was breaking shots in rapid fire. It would like which which sounded to me like he would he initially was suppressing and just creating as many casualties as possible, and then it got more calculated. A little bit more time in between. A little bit of time in between. So yeah. he was he was he was executing people. He was executing people, and then and he and by actually people we should clarify kids, children, nineteen yeah. children and two adults. So he he backed out actually at one time. Um, and went back in, and I don't I don't know what the reason for that, but maybe it was one of the teachers was trying to fight him and pushed him back out because he backed out into the hallway and then made entry again, which also is an indication um, if you're if you understand law enforcement or, mo- or military tactics of it not being a locked breach, a, a locked door, mm-hmm. um, and there was controversy around that. So we went minute by minute, and everything on the video that I did on my YouTube, my company's YouTube, uh, Philcraft Survival was um, filmed, no edits, no cuts, raw emotion. I got angry, I got frustrated, I, I almost wanted to cry. And then, um, um, and we rolled an hour, and I believe it was 40 minutes worth of content out of that. Um, I couldn't sleep for a week after that. I, I still think about it, and it bothers me, but for the 72 hours post analyzing such cowardice and fuck up, I couldn't sleep, and it, and it was bad. Yeah. What's the response you've gotten from law enforcement? Um, mixed. I mean, mixed. Totally mixed. I mean, that that video now has uh, over a million views. We're over a million, John. Right? One point two million. So, um, John, hand me that water bottle. One point two mil. It's I, so nice actually, having your quant the, in the room. Quant, uh, quant, John. Can you? Uh, How many ounces are in that bottle, John? Sixteen. Good. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Uh, Philcraft survive water so delicious. We're supposed wow. to alternate though. We both just chugged water at the same time. My editor's gonna be like, ah, oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> he should split screen. On you that have one. an editor now. Michael is his name. He's actually gonna start joining us in the room shortly for episodes. Oh, he's like a Jamie. He's like a Jamie, but his name is Michael. But are you gonna have the screen up and to be able to look up stuff? I think he can look it up at his desk. Maybe. So I'm gonna move the desk out. Yeah to basically kind of the edge of where John is sitting so he can sit facing this way. It wouldn't actually be that hard to put another screen facing us so we could That'd mirror cool. the screen. Yeah, because yeah, like, for example, the Uvalde thing, would, it would help greatly because I, I received a lot of criticism from law enforcement officers, but here's how I look at it. Um, well, before you get into how you look at it, what was their criticism based in? Um, most of it was Mike doesn't know what he's talking about because they don't know the context of my relationship with law enforcement. Um, and they think that what I'm saying uh, either isn't feasible because of the tactics, because of the lack of training. There's some excuse for the officers that were involved. Some of them justified, but mostly excuses. And so a lot of it's just anger because they think I'm potentially creating a climate of anti-police. And w- with anybody who knows the intimate workings of the company, but me personally, especially, who raises money for police officers without advertising it, because I don't need to advertise that I help out police officers, who has taken a vested interest in improving their training by training them for free, most often, again, not advertised. Uh, even talking to you years ago about getting them trained in jiu-jitsu yeah. and, and, and sponsoring and backing that because it's very important. So um, I, it's, a, it's a mix of emotions. It's an interesting situation. I didn't look through the uh, the video minute by minute because I went through your video and was listening to uh, the feedback that you had. And I landed, in, I landed in the same place that you landed, especially with the frustration. Yeah. Um. It's tough because we view it from a similar tactical lens, meaning our operational background, but also not the same. I can't imagine standing in a hallway of any kind on any type of objective for over an hour, let alone over a few minutes. Mm. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not what we were trained to do, but then looking through it through that lens as well of being a father of knowing the layout of my kids schools and ever being faced with that type of situation, law enforcement or not, it's tough to figure out or to try to justify the lack of action 
And uh, and I actually think it's it's okay, and I actually think it's essential that law enforcement is very critical of themselves in situations like this because they're not condemning the force, and they're not even, I would say, necessarily condemning those particular officers. I mean, those guys are going to have some fucking demons to live with for the rest of their life. But you hear people say all the time, you know, nobody hates bad cops more than good cops. It's time for the good cops to step up and say, hey, like, that was actually a tactical failure. Yeah, a lot of them aren't doing that. A lot of them And that's tough. That. And But let's look at the communities that we came from. How many times have you ever seen the SEAL community step up and go, what was written in that book was incorrect? Yeah. Or what, what happened on that target was unbelievable and we can't allow it to happen again. The answer to that is zero yeah. publicly. Yeah. So they're not alone in that. And I think I understand why, because they worry that by doing so, it will tarnish the the organization permanently somehow, reputation-wise, where I actually think it lands where it restores even more integrity and they can finish off as a community, not, is it Ulvade or Ulvadi? Ova, uh, Ovadi or o Ovadi. Ovadi. Yeah. Not only can that organization, they're going to have a fucking long road to hoe, like bottom line. They're going to have to, they're going to have to own, I believe, their behavior. But law enforcement as a whole, by being open and transparent and having that integrity, it can really, I think, take steps in the right direction. Easy to say, very fucking hard to do. Yeah, I think I think that's the biggest problem I'm having here is, look, this is a small community. And when you look at small communities, policing small communities, police officers know everybody and everybody knows who they are. Yeah. And there's intimate relationships. Um, there's a lot of people that are growing up in the same places they're policing. And a lot of times because of low income, these officers are, I mean, this is, a, I think the average income there was $26,000 median income. Um, a lot of those officers are living in the same places they police. When you lose public trust like that, um, that is a very scary thing for personal protection um, and confidence in law enforcement across the board, not just in active shootings that, that failed, but just in basic uh, task. And so I, you know, this, this anti-police rhetoric that people are talking about with me um, is false. It's a false narrative. But here's what I say in being, um, very vocal about this. I do think that there were officers there that were trying to make the right decisions. But ultimately, I think the fall of this falls on the leadership of the chief, Arundado, who was um, without his radio because he claims that if he had his radio, he'd be compromised in the hallway. Um, so he didn't want to talk on the radio even though he was in a position far away from the actual site um, at what times. What do you mean he would have been compromised? That he would have been talking in the hallway. With the shooter could have pinpointed where he was located and potentially uh, harmed him. So there's okay. a, there, th so imagine we're on an objective and a ground force commander, because you know we, we do ground force, which is in charge of multiple uh, organizations potentially, multiple maneuvering organizations potentially on an objective. Then you have the assault force commander. He was the ground force commander, and his lieutenant was the assault force commander. There was a failure of leadership across the board. And what happened was after the three officers made the initial entry, 11 officers were in the hallways right out the gate, really fast. Within minutes of him entering, um, they were right behind him. Was he still shooting at that point? He was. Okay. So the, the, the indication is when they entered audibly as they are approaching, but as they were entering, they were hearing gunshots. Not only that, but dispatch was also reporting through 911 calls that there was an active shooter in the school. So they get inside the hallway. There is, and you can see it on this video that I reviewed, there's a guy, he's a police officer. I don't know who he is. He's wearing body armor that it looks like he just threw on. So this guy is, I believe he's playing close, right, John? He's playing close, the, the first guy. So this dude's playing close. He's got a pistol. His body armor isn't wrapped on his left side because he didn't have time. It, that, that's what it appears to be. And he is pushing to get into that room. He runs down the hallway with a pistol by himself. His number two and number three men who have carbines don't follow. And he is pushing the momentum because we know momentum 
driving momentum, especially against a, a crisis site or an active shooter, a bad guy with a gun or a crisis site where it's unknown what's happening, but you know it's a bad thing that's happening. He's pushing the momentum in that direction. He's doing all the right things. What happens is he, he doesn't get back up, and as soon as he goes to breach that door, and the door has a window that's a slot in the middle of the window, um, or in the middle of the door, very narrow, like most schools do, yeah. right? Um, he takes incoming fire from the bad guy. Actually takes shrapnel that hits him in the head. He runs back down the hallway, runs around the corner, finds cover and concealment, checks his head, and immediately gets back in the fight. Again, by himself. So this guy who Yavaldi had just done active shooter training. They knew the protocol according to ALERT, which is A-L-E-R-R-T, which is basically the protocol using FBI as the standard for, pro for active shooting. They knew the protocol. This dude was pushing the momentum and wanted to put down the shooter, which is the number one thing you do. The number one priority in an active shooter is saving and preserving innocent life. And then second to that, it's the law enforcement officers' lives. Like they are second to innocent life, right? So you're sacrificing yourself for innocent life. He, he again goes to push momentum, doesn't have any backing. The guys don't even walk back down the hallway with him. He goes by himself. He starts pying off angles, going to the right side of the hallway, to the left side, and doesn't get back up, then they pull back. At that time, the call, according to the reports, was made that they were contained and they were holding their position because now they have a barricaded shooter. And for, for people who say, I don't know law enforcement because I don't know what I'm talking about, I've trained law enforcement for 20 years. The first time I ever trained law enforcement was early on when I was an infantryman in the 3rd Infantry Regiment. After that experience, because I did SRT training with military police officers and law enforcement in Virginia for crisis response and active shootings that took place in the military district of Washington, because that's one of the charters for 3rd Infantry Regiment. Um, after that, in my Special Forces career, I trained law enforcement, like many Special Operations guys, throughout my career intermittently. And then when I was a team sergeant in 10th Special Forces Group in 2010, I trained law enforcement officers full-time, like full-time officers and full-time experiences. Like we trained SWAT teams, we trained patrol officers. And in my job as a, uh, a contractor for OGA, I got FLETC qualified. So I'm a federal law enforcement instructor. I have a uh, my, my undergraduate degree, my second degree, because I have two degrees, is criminal justice. My, my second degree after that is Homeland Security and Crisis Management. My entire career has revolved around this type of thing. And I've probably hosted and trained active shooter 50 times in this country. I, I have actually created a new SOP that I recommend because I used to run the counterterrorism program for post-certified training in the state of California, which I'm post-certified in the state of California. I train New Jersey SWAT team. I train Dallas, Midland, Texas, all over the nation. So this idea that I don't know what I'm talking about, uh, I grew up in a law enforcement family. The idea that I don't know what I'm talking about is, um, is not true. Um, I probably have more credentials and qualifications than most, which is why I'm in a position to tell officers when they're wrong and not afraid to do it. As soon as I did that video, by the way, I will say it on this podcast, I didn't publicly say it before. The BORTAC supervisor contacted me the, the following day and he said, Mike, I want to talk to you. And I was like, all right, let's talk. And I, I for, for one, thought out the gate, this guy was going to criticize me. In fact, I had told John, we're going to get criticized. I'm probably going to get smashed. I will tell you, besides the comments, which are a, a, a few, I have gotten overwhelming support that everything I said, according to federal law enforcement officers, supervisors, and the board tax supervisor was true. But wait, there's more. Because when I criticized Bortac on that video, my criticism was at 12.15, they had Bortac agents show up, right? The, the initiation of this was 11.33 when he came into the building. 12.15, he, um, a Bortac officer show up, and finally somebody's like, who's in charge? Let me remind people at home, Bortac are border patrol agents that work for the federal government. They are not an active shooter response team that flex to schools to take out bad guys. 
It, in fact, that uh, instance in Bortak doing that is unprecedented. Do they just happen to be in the area? They just happen to be in the area. And in fact, some of the officers, because remember, this is a small border town, yeah. uh, um, town where most of the people that are in that town work for the government. They're you know federal law enforcement, they're border patrol, they're they're police officers. So a lot of people were affected by this. The first agents that arrived, their children were either in the school um, or they knew somebody whose children were in the school. And when they showed up in onesies and twosies with U.S. Marshals, there were 276 officers on that site prior to the breach going off. 276 officers. At 12.15, they go in, uh, Bortak shows up. They don't hit the breach point till 12.50, so 35 minutes later. And my criticism of Bortak was, why would you wait that long to do a, a, a deliberate assault, which is what you did, when there were three instances after the initial murdering of the children where there was one shot, four shots, and another additional shot that was taken with an AR-15, which for me and you, understanding how these type of things work, is the go criteria for a hasty assault. I mean, it's a deliberate plan, pre-planned assault, yeah. but it's a hasty assault, meaning you do it now, it doesn't matter, we're going in to save people. Bortak, according to the supervisor, which uh, people are like, well, you believe Bortak, you believe anybody. I'm like, Bortak had no skin in this game. It wasn't their responsibility. They showed up because they wanted to help. And when they showed up um, at, at 12.50, when they hit the door, I thought that odd. I was like, why would they? Their protocols in Bortak training as operators are to conduct hasty assaults. And especially if there's a criteria of innocent people dying. The supervisor told me, one, um, a whole slew of dudes didn't go in the room in that deliberate assault. Only three operators actually entered the room and took out the bad guy who had barricaded himself in the closet. And it's likely that guy barricaded in the closet in the early stages right after the shooting where he barricaded in the closet and waited to ambush the cops. When they came inside, they were in shock because they didn't realize that there was one child or one adult that was in that room because the last call they got from the chief that they got from dispatch was there was an active shooter by himself barricaded in that classroom. And the, not only did the sport tax supervisor state that, but he stated that the three officers who entered just testified to the same. Nobody knew. And, and people are like, well, you believe that? I do believe it. Because if you're an operator in BORTAC, I've, I, I competed in the USASOC, the U.S. Army Special Operations Sniper Competition uh, years ago with BORTAC agents. They're the most capable, most highly trained individuals because our community actually stood them up, at, trained them, yeah. and initiated their assessment, their selection process, and their training process. Um, and I know they're capable. Those dudes, if they knew there were children in there, they would not have stood idle. When they went to go into the room, they got in a gunfight. The fourth guy in the stack did not make entry. Um, in fact, the guy you see with the ball cap that got, takes one in the head, mm -hmm. he actually got shot through the drywall, and he never entered the room. Obviously, they entered the room after the guy was killed, yeah. but they had one new operator on a shield with a Glock pistol. They had two operators with carbines that killed the bad guy in that room, and they did it because um, uh, they thought they were going against a barricaded shooter and had no idea that it was a mass casualty. And I believe them. I, be I believe that's what actually happened. There's a whole bunch of nuance to it, but um, ultimately, here, here's just my sum up. Police officers on that site, on that scene, including the chief and the lieutenant and officers, individual officers, collectively made a lot of mistakes, but should be held accountable for those mistakes. Now, dereliction of duty, according to UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, if it leads to uh, uh, death or bodily injury, could put you two years in prison for dereliction of duty, meaning I'm not going to do that, right? I'm not going to assault that bunker and somebody gets killed, you're going to prison. I'm not saying that they need to be held to the UCMJ because according to a lot of experts and legal that have contacted me, they, aren't, they don't have a legal obligation to defend and protect life. One, that's a problem. Uh, in the state of Texas, because my former commander from Social Operations and 19th Group, um, uh, Tim Oshner, uh, is a, a commander at DPS. And according to him and his community, which DPS are great human beings. They're the first ones that criticized uh, the Uvalde Police Department. On day two, they were like, something was egregiously wrong here. And, and the ch one of the chiefs or one of the directors criticized them, rightfully so. 
Um, there should be not only civil but criminal uh, liability here. I don't know what that is because I'm not a legal expert, but the fact that we're just going to write this off as a mistake, if me and you are on objective overseas and the same thing happened in this kind of format. Oh, we're done. We, we would be fried. We'd be in Leavenworth. Me and you would be in Leavenworth. The commander would be relieved of, of command and likely kicked out of the military and potentially sent to Leavenworth. And that's how we operate. So why are we holding our military children to a standard? But we're not holding police officers who, put, who serve and protect and take a sworn oath. It, it's it boggles my mind. Yeah, it's certainly <clears throat> fucking horrendous situation, right? I mean, even to begin with, it certainly doesn't seem to be simple. You know, it, it's you see a lot of people online, you know, saying things like, "Oh, everybody wants to do," you know big boy shit until it's time to do big boy shit there. And there is an aspect of that. You can see that in some of the body language and the actions of the people. I agree with you on the leadership failure. I've had a few of the, uh, officers who were there that day who've reached out to me privately over email, none of them in that hallway. And actually all of the ones who have reached out were at like a different area of the school. And they, I will, I'll speak broadly and, and paraphrase what the, the emails have said. I feel terrible. I had no idea what was actually going on. And all I can do is sit here and think about what I could have done or what I should have done. And I mean, how many times have you been on an objective where there's a gunfight in a, in a different portion and you have no fucking clue 100. what's going on? So I can't fault the officer who is responding and is like, hey, go be on an external security and has no fucking clue what's going on. And here's some gunfire. I, I, I mean, literally, like. On a large objective, multi-structure objective, there's a fucking raging gunfight going on somewhere, and you're like, well, I'm in a room with cows. You know, like in This is my piece of the pie. This is my piece of the pie. But then if there's a catastrophic, you know, a fatality, you lose one of your friends, you're like, motherfucker, why was I down there with the cows? And it can weigh on you. So I feel for those officers. I don't know if I feel that way about the ones who like, how do you not go up and support the one man? Like that was drilled into me from Day one, if the fucking first guy goes to the door, you go with the guy. If the guy goes through the door, you go into the room. It's not it's not negotiable. I mean, that's the standard that we that we absolutely train to. So there's there's just this very large range and spectrum of thoughts and feelings I have about it from completely empathizing with those officers who didn't know what the fuck was going on and wish they could have done more. To I land in the same place from a leadership perspective. I mean, I don't I can't speak for the army world, but how many times have you heard shoot, move, and communicate? I mean, if you're not communicating at, from a leadership level, guidance down to the fucking operators who are there, if you're not even gonna have your radio on you, and again, I don't know all the facts, but I hope at some point in time all the facts actually come out, and then right after that, comma, people get held accountable to it. Yeah, I, I I'm surprised that even that there's not people uh disgusting like like at the community um organized community um uh what are they called the the things they do where the the, the people talk to the city council the city council meets they uh uh the public is demanding accountability right and and what do you have if you don't have accountability you have 19 families that have been affected uh, of the children that were killed and you have two teachers that were killed in it as well. And so you want something to be done. And look, I, I there is egregious mistakes that you see, but let's just talk about the police chief. The chief's sole responsibility is C2, command and control. That is their sole responsibility. The way you command and control is with the radio. Your lifeline is the radio. If you're a patrol officer, if you're a SWAT officer, you know this. If you're in the military, you definitely know this that the most important uh, piece of equipment you have is that radio. When he decided not to listen to that radio and ignore dispatch, dispatch was communicating all of the things that were taking place within that classroom because calls came in from a child, multiple calls, and they came in from a teacher. Here's what I'll, I'll tell you because the board taxi supervisor let me know this. Both those teachers, an hour, 15 minutes, 26 seconds, whatever the timeline was, a long time after this happened, uh, after they were initially shot, both teachers were alive when they entered that classroom. One died in the a hospital in the ER, 
and one died on the way to the hospital. Now, you have to imagine that you would go, oh, if the kids were killed, then maybe we want to preserve life because why would you want to further injure or kill anybody else? But that's not the case here. In fact, if that was the case where they knew that there were children, but they somehow knew maybe CCTV camera, there was some information or intelligence that was a relayed that there weren't anybody, wasn't anybody alive, then maybe I could see a course of action that would delay the time to breach. But what we do know is that they knew people were alive in the classroom. They heard the shots on three separate times, that uh, one shot, that four, sh four shots, and that one shot. They also knew the teachers were shot because they actually detained one of the, their own officers who was one of the husbands of the teachers. And, and if you see that video, what I'll say about that video. Is that the guy with the punter, uh, blue line Punisher skull on his phone? Uh, they say that, but I think it is, but th there's actual a new CT CTV uh, TV camera video where he actually gets pulled physically as he's walking with his pistol to try to get in the classroom. But it was like, uh, somebody made the comments like, um, yeah, he just did the ultimate like hold me back move, right? Like if your wife, if your loved one, if your child is in that classroom, what's stopping you from getting in that classroom? Nothing. Nothing. Nobody's gonna stop you. And so we also know that the classroom door was never locked. So they kept talking about this key. Do you know what kind of door it was? Was so it metal it's, or wood? It's a wooden door with metal reinforcement and the framing was metal. On like with, the kick plate area? On the kick plate. Yep. And then it had a metal framed window in in the in the middle. Okay. Uh, Bortak told me that they were told that it was locked. They kept saying it was locked, but they went to go breach it. And like good breachers do, they first test the door and they pulled it and it wasn't locked. So you're, if you're thinking about like, what, what are the reasons they didn't go in there? None of them for me pass the dumbass test. All of them are dumb reasons why you would go, this is stupid, we need to get in the classroom. There were officers who showed up, including a DPS supervisor, including a U.S. Marshal, um, and the, the U.S. Marshals reinforced them with shields. They actually handed the shields. They had four shields, ballistic shields, on target before they breached. When they showed up and the U.S. Marshal handed over the shield to Bortak, Bortak had never used shields. Why? Because they don't use contained, barricaded suspects. They don't typically go after that. I think everybody should learn, learn shields because I think they're a tactical advantage, especially against active shooters or high-risk warrants, but uh, hi that's hindsight. When they showed up and they got the shields, you're thinking, oh, so they were waiting for equipment to be reinforced because they needed breaching tools. They showed up. The ballistic shield showed up. The tactical gunfighter showed up. Nobody did anything. The whole reason, according to Bortak, is because they didn't know. And there, there's something to that because I could read the body language and behavior. We're Look, we're good at behavior dynamics because we spend our entire lives looking at demeanor. As Making in, very serious decisions based make, off of it. Exactly. And that's our life. It, whether it's AFO, it's recce or CTR, whatever it is, DA. When you look at this hallway, everybody in that hallway looks like they're at a county parade. They don't look checked in to a tactical scenario. They don't. Even the medic um, and his posture at the very end of the video is odd to me because there's a paramedic who who actually holds back the Uvalde guys from the initial breach of the Bortac guys, but he's gloved up. And and so I'm like, wait a minute, he's, he's gloved up and nobody knew that there were casualties? Wait, it looks like they created a triage point, like they were expect, expecting mass casualties. This isn't making sense. So there's some things that aren't connecting for me, but ultimately I think um, the the most egregious mistake was calling it a barricaded shooter instead of an active shooter, which it was, which sets protocols uh, uh, which are very different than barricaded or contained. Do you know who made that call? The Uvalde chief did. He actually made the call to not do anything. We're backing up and getting reinforcements, and then their posture completely changed. The, the two cops on the side of the... Uh, the T intersection of that hallway as they entered the, the school are at Seoul. I mean, one dude has a carbine, he's like pointing it at the ground, and one guy's got a, a pistol and he's pointing it at the at the concrete. And you're like, dude, if this was an active shooter and you had a guy that was 
a hundred feet down the hallway on the left with a car being who had just killed children, why would you not be checked into the tactical situation? Yeah, There's a whole bunch of things that don't make sense, but a whole bunch of things that do, and ultimately the cops fucked up. They screwed up. And like you said, there are a lot of police officers who were just there, because I can't imagine 276 people uh, knew what was going on at the time. Can you imagine the call over the radios? I mean, I'm sure it was one of those instances where I don't care who you are in that state, you go, well, probably not everywhere in the state, but anywhere nearby, lights and sirens, and you're just hauling ass there to try to help. Yeah. Dude, there were cops. There was a, I don't know if it was a regional SWAT team. I couldn't get it, the answer out of Bortak. I don't know if it was a regional SWAT team, uh, like FBI or, or just a high-risk team that were deploying from San Antonio on their way. So they had contained, held their position, and were waiting for reinforcements from San Antonio. Like, what? So, um, do you know if the classroom that he was uh the shooter barricaded himself and did it have windows that were facing outside both of them did did they have officers posted up outside i don't know but um i it was one of the first things that i thought it yeah. would give you great situational awareness as to what the fuck was going on in the room and quite frankly you can shoot through windows so there's a um i won't uh, tell you who said i won't say it on the radio who who's or on the radio are we got a radio show um the podcast. Mike, I'm, this is Andy over. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> um, I won't tell you who said this uh, in an open forum, but um, somebody told me, um, Mike, you should tell the public uh, to demand to see the CCTV cameras from inside the school. Um, inside the classroom, there was a camera. And then inside of uh, adjoining spaces, there were more cameras. So all of the coverage that you see in the hallway existed on every corner of that school. So there's a lot of evidence that lies out there, including evidence of what took place in that classroom, which I know some of the details. I won't repeat it because I don't want you to have nightmares that are uh, insane, but all points back to what could we have done better? Yeah. Ultimately, what I did that video for is to criticize what I saw as wrong in real time. Um, and I, I, I consider myself the foremost expert on tactical training, as well as the implementation, uh, implementation of tactics and operations. And there was a lot of things done wrong, but most importantly, what we do to become better. Um, command and control and your radio is your lifeline. If you're a police officer and you, li you live and work in a culture that is counterproductive to good guys going and rescuing good guys from bad guys, then you need to leave or you need to find an informal group of people and dial your shit together on your own because the institution is not gonna do, do it for you. I think culturally, there's a significant and deeply rooted problem in Uvalde Police Department, which will come out at a latter point. I, I, I won't conspiracize, um, I won't make shit up, but I, I think it's a lot deeper than just what we see on the surface. I would hope that at some point in time, all of that data is gathered the different camera angles. You got to remember too, probably most of those guys had uh, body cams on as well, which is going to capture the audio. Because I don't know how police radios work. If there is a recording mechanism that like they go, you know, they record it for X period of time in case they need it for legal purposes. But video cameras, you know, the, like, the different body cameras could probably capture a lot of the audio that was going back and forth unless they were on earpieces. But it would create a much better picture and I think it would illuminate areas where people might be trying to hide. Yeah, if JSOC fucks up and and there's an operation that goes bad, and I've seen many of them go bad, um, an internal review takes place, but it's not publicly advertised for, for a good reason. If a law enforcement agency fucks up, if they're in my community, I want all that information. I want access to it because I want to know who is responsible, who I don't need to vote for, um, who I who I need to potentially protest against because it's my community. The people of Uvalde have risen up against all of these players stating that's what needs to be done. And it's true because when you have something so egregious taking place at a public school school where the community has bought into the idea of outsourcing their security and outsourcing their children's education based on the taxes that they pay in that community, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be transparency, most importantly. And I don't think that's being done. Do you think what happened there will change uh, policing policy nationwide? Yeah, it, it will. It, it should because this is a, they're setting a precedent. It's a, it's a new thing to see cops so egregiously make 
such gross mistakes. And and look, there's here's what I'll say. There are people out there because of their political position, their persona, or their popularity, they're afraid of getting uh, chastised by their their center, their echo chamber. Like, fuck you guys. You're, you're being quiet, you're manipulating the information because you're, and, and you're stating all these excuses because you don't wanna lose your base. You don't wanna lose your salary, you don't wanna lose your popularity, and what is it? Like, I am the biggest supporter of law enforcement in the tactical space. Like that's not, I don't even think that's debatable. Like we support, I have half of my instructors that work for me on law, enfor law enforcement officers because I want guys who are law enforcement officers to teach the law in self-protection, not just the tactics. A Delta Force operator isn't a, go a good instructor for teaching people how to self-protect because they've been killing terrorists their entire lives. A police officer is. Not exactly the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> and a lot of people get fucked that up. They mix that up. Yeah. So I I uh, I just hope that uh, these people who are not saying anything, um, they they wake up to the realization of how much they're hurting themselves by not being honest. What I will be is honest. If those cops did the right thing, I would back them, uh, just like I did during the BLM and Antifa protests where everybody was anti-cop, and I stood up and said, "Defund what?" And I know me, you, and some people were like the first ones to say. How about we not defund the police? Yeah. And people are like, oh, well, that's ballsy. Like, yeah, because it's right. You, yeah, you need to invest more. Yeah, you need to invest more money. And we're seeing the the fallout from that, including potentially Uvalde. So that was the only easy topic that I had. You said you had some harder ones. What do you what do you want to go with? Global warming? Yeah. Twenty twenty four election. Oh, what God. do you feel like? Yeah, don't get me started on <laughs> any of those. <laughs> Uvalde pisses me off, man. It's a tough one. Well, there are there are so many different tentacles to that that people will grab onto. One, I think it is so it's a kick right in the fucking teeth because it's kids, and not that. And I, I'm not trying to put a value judgment on the age that at which somebody would be violently killed, but for me, like young children overseas, same thing. Like just watching children be mistreated or malnourished, like it. It just, and especially as a as a father, that one fucking irks me, and it always has, and maybe not everybody's the same way. But I've seen that incident be morphed and shifted, and it's like, you know what? Let's talk about gun regulations instead. And, and I'm willing to have that conversation with people, but I think that they should be separated. And so it's, it's, it's so complex, the number of things that you can talk about. If you chose to, you could go down one of those tentacles, and all of that actually removes itself from the nucleus of that particular issue and that particular problem. It's just, yeah. I mean, gun violence is fucking horrendous. And I, you know, it was 19 kids and 22 teachers. That's less than probably a week in Chicago, which doesn't lead the news, which it should lead the fucking news all the goddamn time. I think they're at 400 deaths this year already, and it's the seventh month of the year. So one kicks people in the teeth and then, from a totality perspective or an overall number perspective, another one's not even talked about. So I don't know. I hate it when situations like that are weaponized to fit people's particular beliefs or narrative set. It's just a tough one for me. Again, yeah. it's hard to actually have a conversation with somebody like we're doing about, let's just talk about what happened on the objective at the school. People are like, well, yeah, those fucking assault rifles. It's like, stop. Yeah. We can have that conversation in a second. Let's go back to talking about school. Yeah, like, fucking mag maggot. I'm like, whoa, whoa. Like, <laughs> let's go back and talk about yeah. the school. It, it just, I don't know. Yeah, it's a tough one for me, man. Well, the part of it for me is these are public institutions, right? When when we as a society buy into the idea of outsourcing things in our lives, which we do with everything, healthcare, protection, security, education, the list goes on. There, we're accepting and understanding that there's going to be a collaborative effort, right? And when you send your kids to school, nobody's thinking that their children in a public institution is going to be murdered. Yeah. Kids can't defend themselves. They're helpless. So when we look at uh, government institutions, let's say federal government institutions, which is thousands of buildings uh, throughout the United States, let's talk about the Capitol building. How many, um, how many security forces exist on the Capitol building, especially after January 6th, um, how many people are 
paid protecting a building because they're protecting the physical infrastructure as well as potential the security of the people and the items that are in that building. Why are we not doing that for our public institutions? Um, when you when you look at the math, because I'm, I'm an Asian, so I, I, I don't need an abacus to do this. I could do this in my head. Super racist. Super racist. John's actually shaking his head like this. He's but, like, but no, true. you can't. John's doing laundry. <laughs> He's doing my laundry in the corner of this room right now. Um, <laughs> He's got one of those rolling machines. but it's, Have you seen that one? But it's just the spinning laundry He's bucket. It. <laughs> um, he's like doing this, churning it. Um, I think that's more Amish, but. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the kimchi. He was churning the kimchi inside gotcha. the jar. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Fermentation, is that, that's part of that process. Um, when you look at um, $40 billion, which we gave to Ukraine, good, bad, or indifferent, let's just say it's $40 billion. If you took an officer, a federal officer, armed, capable, because they train on not just physical security crisis response, but security protocols overall, physical assessments, um, um, checkpoint procedures, all the different things that we navigate in embassies across the United States, I've, I mean, across the, uh, uh, the world. I've done probably 10 physical assessment, security assessment, crisis assessments for embassies throughout uh, the world. You just take that SME, that subject matter expert, and you put them in a school and you pay them $75,000 a year. You could fund every public institution, which includes private and public schools for five years. For five years, you could put a federal officer in every single public institution. So we have, it's the same hypocrisy we face with politicians who are protecting themselves with guns, advocating for infringement against constitutional rights, including the Second Amendment, and we're having a debate, like why should we be focused on guns and legislation against guns that's only punishing law-abiding citizens while you're being protected and your physical buildings are being protected and we don't have a policy that's gonna actually affect change. Do, do I think um, veterans or nonprofits or security guards need to be in our school? No. It's actually one of the things that I agree the federal government should be responsible for. It's like the abortion debate. People have a, a decisive line for their abortion. They're either pro-abortion or they're pro-choice, or pro, pro-choice pro or anti-abortion. When you look at that argument, what the actual argument is, because I heard this on Rogan's podcast with one of the guys, the argument isn't that um, we're saying we're taking away choices from women because we don't, wanna, we, we want the, we don't want the woman to make a, a choice with her body. What we're saying is constitutionally, the federal government doesn't have a place in that type of business based on the founding fathers' uh, uh, view of things. What we are saying, and all these idiots that are protesting that don't even understand what they're saying, is the policy belongs to the state, decentralized from the federal government. Because if you're, in, if you're buying into democracy and you're making a vote, and then you're paying taxpayer dollars because you pay state and federal taxes, we're saying we can't buy into the idea that everybody who lives in this country is going to support and pay for a woman's right or whatever uh, part of this discussion you stand on, uh, non-right, to abort a child. So we're saying it's up to the state to manage that process, like many things, which I agree with. Decentralize the federal government, give them less power, and allow the states to manage that. You want abortions? Move to California. You don't want abortions, move to Utah. So uh, I'm making the same, ar same argument, just Tarantino, it reverse that. N now I'm saying for once, public institutions, when it comes to protecting Americans, especially against mental health crisis, uh, including active shooters, needs to be handled by the federal government because they have the broadest funds. So we say, as a country, can we unite that our taxpayer dollars could pay for this thing called security? Because we did it after 9-11. $17 billion a year goes to the Department of, uh, or, or the TSA, which I think falls under the Department of Homeland Security now, which is a conglomerate, it's a massive thing. And you get checked and screened at every airport because 19 shitheads with box cutters hijack four airplanes. So why are we not doing the same for our children? And that's my, my beef. Everybody could say all these things, 
But if it doesn't lead to a better outcome because we actually make policy that affects chains, then we're just fucking talking in circles. That's mostly what we're doing anyway because we're all talking in an echo chamber and, and the only people that seem to be winning are crooked politicians. F fuck them too. Oh, I agree with that. I was at the Salt Lake City Airport the other day flying back up here down in Utah for a bit, which probably didn't need to say that because I said Salt Lake City. But <laughs> it struck me, I never listened to the goddamn announcements in the back of, you know, the background noise. And at Salt Lake City Airport, <clears throat> kept saying, don't accept packages from people that you don't know. And I was thinking, and I don't know why I was thinking this, but do you know ever in the history of airplanes has there ever been an airplane incident because somebody accepted a fucking package from somebody they didn't know no that was uh that was libya that happened or it was a libyan terrorist that did that with the package it was on repeat there i don't know i have no yeah. idea where i'm going with this but when you brought up the tsa it took me back to that i was literally stuck and then i couldn't not hear it yeah and it was just do not accept a package from somebody that you don't it's like yeah no what, shit. What do you think about TSA though? Do you think it's an inconvenience, or do you, do you think do you think it's a necessary inconvenience to to warrant enough um, inconvenience for security? That's another one that's a difficult question because there's TSA agents, and then there are agents that are outsourced to fill the role of TSA agents at smaller, more regional airlines. And my experience is not the same with both of those. Yeah. Um, I think conceptually, you know, screening people for weapons on a plane, given what happened after 9-11, probably a good idea. Um, if you want to have some fun, Google how many uh, people successfully accidentally get through TSA screening with a weapon every year. Happens all <laughs> the time. Holy shit. Yeah. I personally know somebody yeah. who made it through TSA and had a fucking pistol in their purse. And it the purse went down on the conveyor belt. So, it, you know, anytime at the end of the day, right, when we we're talking about flawed systems, if there's a human being like looking around or not looking around that's maybe hung over or checked out of their job, shit's going to get missed. So is it a perfect system? Of course it's not. I don't think that's possible to create a perfect system. I think screening people for guns, weapons, things that are a risk to either other passengers of the aircraft that could then be turned into weapons like 9-11, good idea. Do I think, I mean, again, it the, the differences, though, between that system and what people probably have never seen because they've never flown private is that what doesn't happen when you fly private. You're literally rolling up and showing an ID card, and there is only one airport, Boston Logan, where I flew in. This was when I was flying the G4. We would go through... TSA security at the FBO, the fixed space operation, which is largely what they're called. There's one here in Kalispell. There's the main airport, and then there's an FBO. It might even be Evergreen or something cool in Montana, like Wispy Pines or some shit like that. Grizzly bear. You go in there, there's nobody checking your bags. There's nobody checking to see if you have a gun. You're putting down an ID card, and you're getting onto an airplane. You can weaponize those things. Just like you can anything else, they're you know they're smaller. But if you have enough money, you can totally get around and travel without the luxury of going through the TSA checkpoint. So, of all the aircraft that are in the air right now, a percentage of them have none of that screening, and the only difference is the monetary means to be able to do so. Mm. Um, there's probably some pretty wealthy fuckers out there who wish harm upon others, or maybe. They just want to move people into place. Maybe they want to move materiel into place and shuffle things across the checkboard, you know, a chessboard, so they can set it up for later on. Um, it's a totally different world. So I think the TSA thing, probably a good idea. Execution of it, I think, is flawed. And there is that massive loophole of flying private. Mm. I, I'll give you an analogy that you'll understand. Um, kind of navigating my my headspace on this. Um, me and you, when we operated early on in the war, we did everything soft skin vehicles oh yeah right um we were in hiluxes um soft skin hiluxes which is a toyota pickup truck uh, forerunner basically yeah forerunner uh we did it in open back humvees like where the doors were taken off and everybody flat bottom humvees just flat bottom right we did it in um soft skin vehicles cars 
whether it was Recky, Loviz. And then we started getting blown up. And then as we got blowed up, we started building reinforcements because we were reactionary. We said, oh, well, the threat is we get blown up from the bottom. They bury mortar rounds or yep. you know whatever on top of each other. HME. Uh, yeah, homemade explosives. And then we did V-shaped holes. We do a contract. A lot of money is spent. Military industrial complex is great for that. We, we have the V-shaped hole and we get higher off the ground. We got the detectors, we have the jammers, we have all these things that are- Sweepers leading. up front, Sweepers the rollers. Up front, the rollers. And then the enemy gets smart and they go, well, we're gonna create a IED that hits from the side. So Iran's technology integrated into tactics on the battlefield, they start hitting us with shape charges. And the shape charges, uh, in fact, with Task Force 16, that became 17 um, with JSOC, um, I was there right after the trip where three SEALs, I believe, were killed in an up-armored GMV when it got hit with an EFP from mm -hmm. the side, cutting them in half and then cutting the barrel of the 50 cal in half. I remember how they said it was so violent because of the shape charge. My my point is, oh, as we grew, we, we, we have the VCF hole, we get armor, more armor, and then everything's remote. So now we're on the battlefield in literally a tank that's on four wheels, driving down a road and have no ability to see the enemy, to react to the enemy, unless you're the remote weapon system operator on the gun. And it gives us a distinct disadvantage in some instances. So what we are doing essentially in, in, in this country is reacting because we think that there's a, there is a fix and the fix will, uh, will be the solution to the problem for here on out. It's like the idea of taking away guns. Guns are the tool. If the mental health crisis is the cancer and we're just putting a Band-Aid on cancer, we're not addressing the issue. So what we're going to likely see is things like, hey, guess what? Bad guys, they don't follow the law. They don't look at gun-free zone signs. They don't care about your laws because they're breaking it. Um, thank God this kid, Eli Dickin, goes into uh, shopping with his girlfriend, a 22-year-old kid in Indiana, active shooter, pre-planned, a mass shooting. This wasn't like a, a random act of domestic violence that turned into an active shooting. Pre-planned, an active shooting. Goes into a bathroom into the shopping mall, loads his kid up, walks out of it, starts killing uh, uh, innocent people. Winds up killing four people before he's gunned down by a 22-year-old law-abiding citizen that's by the left deemed a criminal. The view, those, those, I'll probably get sued for this. Those women from the from the View um, criticized him because they said he was breaking the law. He should be in jail. This 22 year old was constitutionally carrying because Indiana's constitutional carry law um, draws his pistol from 40 yards, shoots the, shoots the bad guy eight out of ten times, and puts him down in the dirt where he belongs, saving countless lives. Like the focus needs to be on empowering people and protecting their civil and constitutional liberties and rights. If we do that more often, then it's going to lead to better outcomes. We're, we're chasing our, our tail in circles. 19 uh, terrorists on 9-11, there, there apparently was a 20th one, but 19 of them with box cutters and a good plan of action executed 9-11, killing 3,000 plus Americans. Um, that wasn't a bomb. It wasn't a... Um, a gun, it wasn't a tool. It was the innovation and motivation of an ideology that happened to be radical, that killed all those people. You're not going to stop violent actors from doing that. Stop focusing on that. Stop focusing on that. And I think- Well, the I, only way you can stop them is by putting them down. Absolutely. After the decision is made, yeah. the only response that's an appropriate reaction is putting them in the dirt. What did the hosts of The View, what did they think that that young man should have done? Just let the other person keep shooting? Of course they didn't say that. Um, they didn't go down that rabbit hole. But they were I wonder in, if they have armed security at the building that they filmed that show yeah, at. I know most of those uh, celebrities have private detailed security, they, but they think it's okay. Um they really they so they were positioning that as this as the twenty two year old man who responded was the one who was at fault there. They didn't say he was at fault, but they said he broke the law, like like he shouldn't be like he should be in jail essentially. 
and I'm paraphrasing it because somebody told me because I I refuse to listen. Yeah, he should be charged with being yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah, he he's a fucking national treasure. He's a hero, right? Uh, very different from the situation with Rittenhouse, where he puts himself in a position where things go wrong, and he defends his life, and he he gets dropped of all charges appropriately because he's protecting, but he's not there with a gun. He's constitutionally caring, not looking for a fight. Yeah, he, The fight comes to him, and he steps up to the table. As a law-abiding, responsible citizen, as we say in Phil Kraut's Survival, as a responsible citizen doing the right thing, which we all should be doing. I just feel like a statement like that, referencing the women on The View, the, I, I feel like the only way you could make a statement like that is if you were so incredibly detached and had never been around violence of any kind. Yeah, that's exactly what- Which I hope they haven't. I mean, I hope yeah. nobody is around violence. I'm not advocating for violence, but it's like take a second and try to imagine yourself in that situation and you're in the mall and you're proximal to that person. You're telling me that you wouldn't want an armed citizen to end that threat before other people lost their life? Like, what kind of fucking headspace is that? I don't understand that. I don't either. I mean, it's, it's people living in a bubble and- very complacent because they don't have to face the realities. They don't live in the neighborhood of Austin in the inner city of Chicago. They don't live in Baltimore, Maryland in the inner city. Um, again, a lot of these actors are exactly that. They're actors. They're, they're only used to pretending to be other people. Uh, I like the hypocrisy of all these people who are talking about gun control, uh, including Matt McConaughey, who, who you know has some good views, who's an intelligent human being, who happens to be from Uvalde. And, and then he comes out saying that we need to take broader responsibility. That's kind of hard to state when you've made movies where you're killing people and shooting them in the face with guns, right? That's very hypocritical of you. It's a complex conversation, for sure. I wish people could have a conversation objectively and pick one area, discuss it, maybe a little move on to the next, as opposed to when it gets to an issue or an area where they start feeling uncomfortable then it becomes emotional and they try to lump or go down another one of those tentacles. Yeah. I, I, I secretly wish more guys like you, myself, even Jocko's the, the leaders of this culture that we've created around us, um, and be more involved in politics. I know our stance on it cause we talked about it before, but I wish there was an entry point for us. Like I wish Jocko would run for president because I'd like to see him win. But the reality is he probably wouldn't because he's not lobbying. Um, he doesn't have corporate uh, America um, and he's, he's not getting paid by him. Like he's not, he's not going to be one to um, bow down. And everybody we know, everybody that I know who's gone to Congress, who's still there, has some form of like, man, their, their hands aren't clean. Yeah. You know, they've they gotten dirty and they've changed. And uh, that happens a lot in life, but to see, to see no hope for the future of America in the political space is terrifying, because we we talk about all these things because they're social issues, um, and and they're driving us to talk about it. But what is it actually accomplishing if we can't get anything done politically to create a policy or a law that's affecting change? So, and then to see who's in charge of the country, I mean, this guy is almost damn near in hospice like he's like and that's no exaggeration like he could barely communicate with words in english i'm not gonna lie when he doesn't have a teleprompter i really enjoy it it's it's funny on one hand yeah on the other hand it's hard to enjoy it because he holds the highest office in the united states government can you believe that guy's the president of the united states he he knuckle bump a bump bumped uh, the Saudi uh, Saudi Arabian uh, prince. It's like. Did you watch that documentary about yes, the uh, the journalist they had killed in their fucking embassy? Yeah, they have audio recordings of them sawing his body into pieces. Yeah, it's, oh, that's right. They got him out of there in small bags, right? In small bags. Yeah, they exfiled him out of small bags into a vehicle. Didn't one of the princes send his private jet over there? Like that's what I'm saying. Like they were able to yeah. track that manifest. All of it. They yeah. all that information was was leaked. And it was a direct order, apparently, by him. Yeah. I, the scariest place I've ever flown through is Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where I was like, I mean, I won't say what happened there because <laughs> <laughs> I flew through there and I was like, oh shit, I, this is the wrong place to be. Yeah. And um, it was not very fun. And I was like, this is radical 
as fuck. Like you, you think you think right wing extremists are radical? You think leftist lunatics are radical? Dude, I mean these dudes are still stoning people to death. They're like doing public uh, uh, hangings in the city square that women can't drive type shit. And this is a country that we are buddies with. I mean, we're boys according to Biden because he fist bumps his boy. Like, what the hell are you doing, man? It could have been COVID protocol, Mike. I mean, that's true. Yeah, you know, yeah. Where, why aren't you looking at the other side of this coin? That's true. Yeah, yeah. It could have been. Could have been. You think Biden, he's got COVID though? Now he does. So, yeah. <laughs> so right now, like actually, right now. You think he'll run again in twenty four? He'll be dead by then. You think so, dude? He is. Do you, so if he is dead. This is where, John. Do you have any tinfoil over there? Because we could fashion a fucking hat. If he is dead, mm -hmm. would it be because his own party did that to him, or natural causes? Well, I just heard. I can't remember whose podcast it was. Might have been. Might have been Rogan's about the, the Clinton, um, all the people associated with. I think it was thirty-seven or thirty-nine people have either had accidents. In You've seen Evan's video about this, right? Yes. You take a deadly fall out of a canoe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you shoot yourself in the back of the head. Oh, speaking of that, let's talk about this because you have... Good lateral on the tinfoil hat part. Fucking quality move. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Um, that Black Rifle Coffee shop that you just... Um, Mere blocks from where we are right now. What is the story behind... We, we mentioned it before... But I like to I like you to reiterate the story of this dude. Oh, is this Mr. Thibodeau? This yeah, is okay. real. All right. So, uh, probably most people watching and listening realize I'm opening up a BRCC outpost. That's what they call yeah. it. Um, what, they, what is what is that outpost? I think it's just a, a different terms because it's a different brand. I don't know what Starbucks calls theirs. Oh, it's, but it's it's just a coffee shop. Does outpost mean it's like coffee shop with a fireplace and I believe that they are all internally. Uh, and used in uh, external media coming from the company called Outposts. So got it, any got it. A, a Black Rifle coffee shop would be outpost. an outpost. Got it. So uh, my business partner and I have been working on this for, I, I want to say we are approaching two years. So we, even, we went out there and we walked you through today. What it looks like today didn't look like that 30 days ago, let alone 60 days ago. It was kind of just the concrete slab. It has been the craziest process and you're asking me like, Hey man, are you fired up? It's like, this is still like largely, it feels conceptual. Cause we looked at PDF documents for like a year wow. before a shovel ever went into the ground, you yeah. know, working with architects and figuring out branding and what did we want it to look like? And so the fact that there's like a partial structure up there right now is still hard for me to wrap my head around. Yeah. And we walked around and it's massive. It's awesome. And it sits on a quarter of a city block. Um, in Old Town Kalispell or, you know, just off of Main Street in Kalispell. You and bought that block. My business partner bought the block. Which is the land. that You actually own the land. Correct. Right? It's yeah. a quarter of a city block. And on there was a historic brick building. And adjacent to that, I think there was a slight air gap in between the walls. It was a laundromat. Like a, a more modern era laundromat. Probably from like the 70s or 80s. Okay. Um, it was once a whorehouse. It went through a variety of things. So yeah. Gus, you know, Gus Thibodeau was uh, an entrepreneur. Yeah. And, you know, in the foundations, they're pulling out like old car jacks because there was some mechanic stuff that went on there. Painted on the wall, it's this says Rex Flower on the outside. I don't know if they had that type of storage, but. There's a penis in the concrete. I saw that as well. I put that there. Oh, okay. So. I see. I thought that was Jebedo, Jebediah. What's his no. name? Uh, Gus Thibodeau. 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 Jebediah. I, thought I don't know close. about you guys, but like when you put your card in and they ask you for a signature on those iPads, yeah. all I do is draw dicks. That's the only thing I do. So I basically just signed the, I'm not joking either. I, yeah. Leah will sit there and be like, oh my God. <laughs> like, let me have my special things. You tipped a dick, sir. Can we get some cash? You here? get 18% and a cock. All right. <laughs> so profile for people wondering because there's a variety of different ways you could go head on view i usually go for uh, left to right are Sh we still talking about cox or we are yeah <laughs> <laughs> much like my signature i just john's over here just fucking dying he's like yeah profile he's, balls deep he's like dicks profile's my favorite too <laughs> <laughs> over there just shaking um so he it did there was a little whorehouse action that was going on there and the gus died on the property he was in the southeast corner. There's a water spout. And from my understanding of what was going on is he was doing some welding because it, there was a little bit of leakage in the southeast corner. It's probably 
20, 25 feet up. And while welding, he started himself on fire. Now, I don't know if anybody knows if it was the fire that killed him or the fact he did a header off of the wall, but both happened. So he essentially accidentally killed himself while doing maintenance on the property. Or did somebody murder him? That would be possible, too. That's a fucking intricate plan to somehow... This Rex Flower guy is suspect, man. Whoever Rex Flower, Rex... I don't think was tied to him. Rex, oh, okay. yeah. But it's the same building, though, right? It was same Rex... building, but maybe they just like let him pay money to slap that up on the outside, yeah. you know, like a billboard. How'd you find out about this story? It's a historic building. So there is actual... All the archives have yes. information. Yes, so there's on. information about that. And I think one of the architects actually found it. I think we'll probably put a plaque up in honor of Gus and offer a, like a caramel macchiato with like a nice foam on top of it. You just take like a butane torch across the top for him, like a nice little... Caramelized Caramelize Gus. it up for Gus. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, that sounds delicious. The Thibodeau. It sounds the Thibodeau sounds delicious. I think so. Ooh, frothy. You got to have it nice and frothy. Yeah, maybe but, like a sprinkle of like a little bit of blood. You don't. But also blood was there. But, but also burnt, burnt to a crisp. <laughs> yeah, on the top. Is there pictures of Gus? That, uh, I have not personally seen one, but I bet you there is some out there. Where is the one out there? I what I I love about that space is you could fit 120 people in that space. I think you can fit 120 people in there pretty easy. It yeah. is like when I had you go over to that northeast corner and you look back on what it's actually going to be. That looks like. So I don't know who was with me. Um, when I was in Dallas, Fort Worth, I was in a BRCC, a Black Rival Coffee, that had half, dude, not even half the space, like a, like a third of the space. And we had 200 people in it. Yeah. 200 people. Like, I mean, we were all sweating profusely and it was disgusting because I was spitting on everybody because I was standing on a chair. Yeah. Because there's no room for me to talk to anybody at ground level. And as I was See, talking- See, we're not going to have that problem with I this. was literally spitting on people as they were looking at me up, up at me with their mouth open. I was like, I apologize. I just spit all over you guys. I'm sorry. They liked it though, I think. I don't think we'll have that issue there. And then there's the outside. You know, when we were having the idea of how big we wanted it to be, like full disclosure, the architects were like, this is too big. You're, it's going to be too big. They wanted to do probably a third of what it was. And then we talked them into two thirds. And then finally, in one of the meetings, I just said, hey, like, this is our money. Please just make it this big. Are we talking about the penis again? Or are we back to the actual structure? I hadn't, I hadn't put the mark of the beast on the foundation yet because we had to figure out what the footprint of the foundation was going to be. But bigger is better is what I've been told. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know that's true. But we wanted to build a space that Jack Carr could come up and launch his next book, which, you know, in the James Reese series, maybe he can get another TV show, whatever. <laughs> You're lucky, Jack. Fucker. Carried you through your career. But then we wanted to have a place where you could come up and do a seminar, yeah. but there's a huge outdoor aspect to it as well. The summer months right now, I mean, we're recording this in July. It's fucking beautiful out. Yeah, it's perfect. The sun doesn't go down until like 10 o'clock. So maximize that with outdoor space while it's out and then have a really cool indoor space in the months where you know people are looking for more of a place to go inside. This I, I hate to say this place is cool because I, I don't want anybody else coming here. Cause You're talking I, about the I, coffee shop or Kalispell? Kalispell as a whole. It's The secret's already out. The, is it? it? The property values, and people get so pissed at me when I take pictures from my back porch at the house we did yeah. the first podcast. I always like those. Oh, fuck you. You're, you know, people are going to come to Montana. I'm like, oh, have you ever seen the TV sto show Yellowstone? Oh, mm, go fuck yourself. Yeah. yeah they have a little bit yeah, more reach than me. Yeah. Have you ever watched the movie River Runs Through It? Yeah, guess what, asshole? Yeah. That was in Montana as well. The secret's out. Property, property values in the last two years went bananas. Yeah. I do think it's already hit the point where locals – they can't afford to live here anymore. They'd do great if they sold, um, but there are there are more people coming here for sure. I think the secret it's it's out on most places. Yeah, we we put that video up on uh, at Mike or no Mike Glover actual on YouTube. So that video which one will be a, the the walk around of the, the coffee shop. Of, the coffee shop. That's the first content of any kind around that project, other than pictures too. So that'll give people a good insight as to what it's going to look like. Yeah, it's cool. And I would say. Fuck, what day is today? 24th. Let me care. Quant, if today is July the 7th month, if it was 90 days from now, what month would that be? Uh, October. October. Good. I was just double checking my math. I got there before you. <laughs> In October, I think the soft, soft opening. The flaccid opening is. The flat, yeah, the yeah. limp opening could limp. occur. 
And uh, what's the, the hard opening? The excited, the, block hard. the excited opening. Oh, that ties right into to John. Rock. It does. Rock. R O K hard. R O K hard. So we can't get suppressed on social <laughs> yeah. media. Uh, I'm going to say late November. You you should have an account <laughs> called at Rock Hard. You should. But it's R O K hard. You're welcome for that. By yeah. the way, um, I see you're using a SIG, and um, of course. For years. Um, it's so funny because I go... Is that the one that you're going to gift me? I'll take that one right so there. So it's funny. <laughs> so this isn't the one I'm gifting you, but um, Dave Mods, who's my custom fabricator for these SIG guns. Same gun though, right? It, same gun. Yeah. Same exact gun. A uh, ported... Um, it has everything. It's got the 509T optic. It's a serrated cut. Grip angle's changed. It, it's like a SIG 320X, like what I would want to make. But I told... I already told... Um, Dave, I'm like, hey, man, we have 25 of these in the first run. I'm selling those on, basically, I'm selling them on Patreon, which I'm not selling a gun on Patreon. I'm selling the slot deposit on Patreon, members only, t uh, for Tier 1 and Tier 2, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash Mike Glover. It's really easy to find. Um, and I've already sold all of them. Oh, shit. Yeah. Not I, serial number there, 001. There might be like five. We might do an extension of this, but not 001. And then Andy's like, yeah, I'm like, what number you want? And of course, <laughs> he's like, uh, of course, zero zero one. And I'm like, well, I have zero zero zero, so yeah, I'll give you zero zero Fair. one. That's this is zero 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 actually. I have used. I, I'll be the first to admit I'm biased on Sig products because I, yeah. I got we were using two two sixes all the way since the late '90s for me at least. Yeah, I know some of the teams. Uh, I think played around with Glocks a little bit. I don't mind Glocks. Yeah, they have never felt great in my hand. Sig products, for whatever reason, have always been. Super comfortable. You actually hooked me up with this one. This is the, what do they call this thing? Three six five XL. The comp. Spectre Comp, whatever it is. Yeah. This thing is freaking ridiculous. That's thing, like man. the best gun I think made right now for concealed carry. But I do think, um, what's the date today? Twenty third. When does this drop? Today's the twenty fourth. Uh, let's see here. Let me hit the button. We're in because I, I potentially couldn't launch it until August first. August first. So yeah, I can't even talk about this. So forget what I said. Sig's coming out with a new gun. That's all you need to know. And I'll be the first to release it because I tested it and um, was involved in the engineering aspect. But it takes that 365 XL comp right there and just makes it a lot better. It, really? Because that's already a very good gun. How many how many rounds does that take? Mine holds 20. <laughs> you just made that up. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 20 rounds of 22. I um, don't know. What is this? It's 12. It's a 12 round mag. You don't know what I got in my mag. Well, you have probably 11 because you don't put an extra one in there. I have 10. Those weren't even real rounds. Those were simunition I rounds. have 10 because it's I don't like the, it's hard to get the magazine <laughs> seated. You know. It's 12 plus 1, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I can see that from here. Yeah. Um, the, it's it's going to have a uh, larger magazine capacity. Okay. And it's going to knock, I think, Glock 19s and Glock 17s out the box. That's what I'll say. I feel like you've already said too much and Sig's going to be calling you on August 1st. They potentially will. Um, but it, but um, it's not a bad thing because... Um, you have to wait for it to come out in about a week from now from this podcast drop. Um, but I think it's going, because it's, you remember, uh, 365XL was only an inch thick overall. Yeah. So it's slim fitting. But that, in my brain, doesn't make sense when you think about a high magazine capacity. That has 12 rounds in it. High magazine capacities usually are 17 plus rounds. Like, how can you do that? Well, SIG's figured out, so... I basically told you everything about it. I might as well tell you the name, which I won't, but yeah. it's called the... <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. I can't say anymore. What are your thoughts on... Actually, I already know your thoughts, but I just want to hear you repeat them on everyday carry because you post about it all the time. So I think everyday carry is a every damn day responsibility is what I say. And I, I, the reason I say that is because when you look at this kid, Eli Dickin, who took the opportunity to be a responsible citizen... Terrible last name, by the way. Terrible last name. Because I was thinking it could have been Dickens. Because if you've gotten the Dickens, like you've been, there's many ways that you can go about that. Eli's been dicking around. You've been know, dicking at the mall. around. Yeah. You've been dicking around the mall. And and he he's a, a kid who found the courage, the intestinal fortitude to make a difference and change the world. The mental health crisis that we're seeing translate into acts of violence, which means incre uh, increased crime statistics, especially in um, heavily populated areas, drug use, suicide, g gun, name it, um, gun violence, uh, and those acts, name it, um, is only going to get worse. So this is very simple as a concept. If you train for yourself, if you train for your family, 
you need to train for your community. And it, it, what I've always been dumbfounded because I've always been the one to kind of, like somebody said, why do you always seem to be on the scene of accidents helping people? And I went, because if I saw somebody in distress, I would not uh, uh, bypass them. Yeah. Because I'm trained in first aid and trauma. I'm trained to go to the sound of gunfire. So it's my personal responsibility. But good Samaritans aren't a thing anymore because of the legal liability, the culture, all the problems. We need to be more responsible. So every day carry, every damn day, and, um, and, and do so and be trained. I, and I, and I, I say this often, I just trained uh, at Little Belt Cattle Co. with, uh, with Greg, um, amazing dude. Um, he's not very tall. He's a little guy. He's cute. He could be standing vertically under this table right now. But you know, he's like Tom Cruise. Like he's handsome. He's ruggedly handsome, but in like a cute way. I mean, I'd hit that if I was a woman and I was little er than him, which is very like a midget. I don't even know how to handle that comment right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I wanted him to start a podcast. I'm sorry, Greg. I apologize for all that. Um, but he's I got a little feel horse, like... too. He's got a tiny horse. Are we talking about an animal or his dick? <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. His dick, of course. Tiny little horse. Tiny little horse. Yeah. Yeah, you can't even get a saddle on it. It's so small. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, Greg. I love you. <laughs> Greg's fucking awesome, man. Yeah. I love Greg. And and Greg is changing the whole field of ranching and farming. He He's, should do a podcast, not to interrupt you. He should. He should. On, base, on just that topic. A hundred. He. I told him, if you did a podcast called Little Built Cattle Co., and it was farmers, ranchers, but this kind of thing which I'm super curious about, but just don't have a lot of access to information, it would crush, and he's such a good personality for it. And he can start off like once a month. You know, yeah. he doesn't have to like twice a week or once every week. That's like, it. Just, yeah, you could do once a month. To me, I know almost nothing about it, so it'd be fascinating just to hear somebody who is entrenched in that talking about it. I, it's We had a conversation over a lot of wine the other day, and I was, I was gonna, I wanna buy cattle for Ben Walker Trading Co., which is my, my, my family business. Um, because I want to do a different model of business behind cattle, which includes getting to know your food, like literally being able to go out with your family to the ranch, pet your cow, have, have you and your family see the process of how they're fed, how they're moved. Hell, get on a horse with Greg and push that cattle. And then when it's time for that cow to be processed, you have a better appreciation. That for me is a better price point. Um, but a kind of an innovative thing, apparently, in this whole industry of it's like a factory system. And I think Greg brings that attention uh, with you know his special operations background as a SEAL and bringing that to uh, the cattle industry, which I think is cool. I agree. John, flip around and look at the uh, red recording screen. What's the number at? Top, it's the very top. How long have we been going? Hour and 40? 20. Hour and 20. We have 10 more minutes. Okay. I promise you only 90 minutes because I don't want you to get in trouble. No, I won't get in trouble. Yeah, it, unless it's over 90 minutes. What do we got? <sighs> We've covered a lot. What would be another super easy topic to cover? What else you got going on for Fieldcraft? Not a lot. Just kidding. We got so much. Man. Well, let's talk about what we have going on in uh, Dallas. Oh, yeah. Dallas is a big deal, man. Um, because that'll be, if this comes out on Monday, that'll be the Saturday after this episode comes out. It'll still give ch people the chance to sign oh, up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, me and you are at the Texican, um, I believe it's a motel. It's an old motel that's been renovated. It's a really cool spot. Um, they remodeled it and they put business centers and conference rooms in there. One that could host 300 plus people, the other host 200 people. And we're doing our standard leadership seminar for um, those two spaces where you do two blocks of instruction. Yep. I do two blocks of instruction, but the groups rotate out of those. And the cool thing about this, besides it's in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which is the new headquarters for uh, Phil Krause Survival. You is, moved it out of Heber. No, it's it, we, we're keeping Heber. We're expanding. Okay. This yeah. is uh, HQ South. Yeah. I'll call it uh, Outpost. That sounds like a good name sure. called fieldcraft outpost um outpost fieldcraft yeah outpost fieldcraft um it, it's a cool opportunity for you to do something um including learn leadership 
and then have the ability to break bread with me and you for dinner. And it's a more intimate setting. What I will say about that is it's a bargain because I know your speaking engagement fee, mine's a lot lower than yours. Mine's about a third of what yours was at the top of the game. And uh, the feedback that we were getting, which is good feedback, was, man, my company would have paid a lot of money and we got this opportunity and the, those little tidbits were gold. And, and I think that's the benefit that you'll get is you're getting, man, a lifetime seemingly of experiences from both of us on leadership, on entrepreneurship, uh, and, and two different workshops where you get to cross-reference both of them. I, I believe we're doing lunch and if you want to, you could stay and pay for dinner. And probably a Q&A with both you and I, right? Yes, of course, yeah. So this is the third time we've done this. Uh, both of the other times we're up in, in Heber City. Yep. and Yeah, the, the feedback has been cool. I actually really enjoy it. My favorite part of all of that, like I could get up at this point, as I'm sure you could, and I think we largely did this the very first time. It was just like, boom, leadership, here we go. Through the lens of largely the mistakes I have made uh, while in leadership's positions, while, uh, which was a robust dossier, mm -hmm. much thicker than my success stories. Uh, but the I love the q and I love specific questions on what people are actually dealing with so you can give them precise feedback that can hopefully make a difference. Yeah. I don't know how many opportunities. I mean, podcasts are great, but it's you and I talking. We might mm -hmm. get near a question that somebody has but we don't answer it directly, specifically to them, and then have more time. The dinners are cool, too, because you get to know people uh, better. I've enjoyed both of them. I'm glad we're doing a third. I think we should do that probably every quarter. Yeah, that's what we're... That's, the coffee think, shop yeah, actually would cool. be a good place to do one of them as well. Ooh, we should do We should do that... Uh, the the four, this It would be the fourth one this year. After, after it's open. After it's open. Yeah, That'd be okay, awesome. that's easy. Yeah, I'm doing... Uh, one of the things that I'm I'm putting together now that I'm super proud of is um, look, like the book I'm writing with Penguin Random House has a lot to do with resilience because preparedness is this idea of like what happens when you get knocked down. Like what do you literally do? What do you figuratively do? And I, I've already forgotten what I agreed to write for your book. Yeah, uh, situational awareness. Was it situational awareness? I don't remember. No, it was resilience. Was it? Yep. I don't know much Did about it Did you either. write it? No. Holy crap. That's due like soon. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you mother you said i could talk into the microphone you can you can because that will just transcribe what you said okay I and then fix it because it will sound like i forget that what, is good i forget what topic you asked me it's to do. oh shit i don't know cool. maybe resilience i think it's resilience actually i think it's mindset slash resilience we'll, we'll find out i'll find i'll source the text it's you know what been, I, but it was like a year ago here's what i know it's what? gonna be good it's gonna be so Fucking good. good it's gonna be so good Every Navy SEAL I've met can write really well. Yes. Because you all yes. got publishing agents, so it's obvious that you write well. Well, when you just make shit up, it's easy to get a book deal. <laughs> They're all fiction. <laughs> They're all fiction. Are they, though, Mike? No, Are they? No, they're for real. I mean, James Reese was is a real person. Jack rolled in quite a few people, I think, into that character, which is what... But it, also, yeah. he is not trying to make it nonfiction. It feels really real because I'm having PTSD from those shows. It's our terminal list. It's amazing... The detail that he put in there that I bet goes over a lot of people's heads. Oh, yeah. For those that, that we pay attention to and go, yeah. they got it right. Yeah. Because I'm not yelling at the, the screen on Amazon going, what in the fuck is going on? I'm going, oh, well, nice. Did nice you see touch. the scene where he got killed? I did. Uh, and if you haven't watched the show, I was just kidding about that. But <laughs> <laughs> Spoil. Oh, yeah. The author, Jack Carr, gets killed, not James Reese, which you would know if you read the series. But God, he is a terrible actor. So bad. He's fucking terrible. Yeah. I would have cut that scene right on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Yanked his residuals right I think they kind of did cut it. They just kind of like, they were like, oh, he's dead really fast. They gave him the minimum amount of being involved so he would feel like he was a part yeah. of it. They're like, Jack, close your eyes. Okay, that's cut. Yeah, that's it. That was that was done. Isn't it was it, it's well done. I'm proud of Jack for that. I, I'm whole. not proud of Jack for anything. <laughs> not a single thing. <laughs> Apparently, the second series that he's writing um, is going to be on you. The dude's name is Andy. That would be the single most boring series in the history of. But books. it's called Stump. It's not Stumpf. That's it's what most Stump. people call me. Actually, hey Stump. Yeah, like what's up? What your name is Andy Stump, and now I just say, yep. Did you have a call sign? We didn't really do that. Oh, really? Why did you guys do that with OGA? Um, you're, you were having a conversation with somebody, and you were like, "We're referencing a bunch of." It's it's because um, 
uh, there's a lot of radio traffic. And so nobody, everybody who communicates on the radio, they want to be able to use a pro word instead of a name. Yeah. Because all the, tra- basically most of the communication is done radio. So you're like, it's like, hey, you, this is me. Yeah, it can be it, snapped up. It, yeah. It's be- easier to make a one word thing than, you know, there's five mics on base and you're like, which mic is this? What was the best call sign you heard in OGA? My first call sign Evan Hafer gave to me. And you know what it was? Gaijin. That's powerful. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but it wasn't for gay Asian. It was for giant Asian. And, and the no, first- No, the, it was for gay Asian. It, <laughs> my, first ba- my first chief was like, your call sign is gay Asian combined? I was like- Correct. Sir, um, no, it's giant Asian. He's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this dude's going to get an EO complaint. Like, oh, this is not good. Oh, resilience. I'm hosting a resilience course that I invited you to, but you turned me down. Because I can't make it. I know. You got some stuff to do overseas. I, I get that. But the the premise is a three-day, um, we call it resilience rendezvous, where it's building resilience. Like, I've built resilience and special operations preparation courses and preparing young men and women for the challenges of special operations in the military. And it's been very effective. I use some of those techniques. Um, some of the, the the way I break it down is we, we it's fire, it's hammering, and forging. Just to give a knife analogy, you got to heat, you got to be more vulnerable. You got to hammer. You have to break them down and expose them to their weakness. And then you got to forge. You got to rebuild them and reshape them. And in that three day process, everything from cold plunge to heat therapy to optimizing your performance and different uh, life hacks. It's all going to be uh, a course that we run in Wyoming. Uh, it's going to be epic. Um, well, count me in November. for the subsequent ones. Yeah, it'd be fun. It's in mid-November. You were one of the primaries for one of the in, um, the blocks. Um, but I could, I just, I mean, I could throw a rock and hit a Navy SEAL, so it's not. It's accurate. Fun. Yeah, I mean, there, literally, there's another Navy SEAL. John is a Korean Navy SEAL. He hates when I say that. Yeah. But John Park is a Korean Navy SEAL. Like rock, legitimate. Rock hard on IG. Rock hard on I, IG. Go find his <laughs> IG. You better start that Patreon account. Um, right Patreon. now. Patreon.com, rock hard. I mean, that might... I don't never been on OnlyFans, but I feel like that would be a good name, too. He would crush. He would crush. He would crush. It would be... And all, you could just take pictures of, like, rocks. Yeah. <laughs> it's I don't a rock know collection what fucking people fans. pay for, but... Like, but you blur it out. You just blur it out, making it look like, oh, that's weird, and it's just yeah. a rock. But he holds him over his crotch. Like big black rocks? Yeah. You know what I mean, John? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> John's not enjoying this particular portion. We need of the to get the camera on John. That's that's what needs to happen. What are we at, John? One thirty. All right. Um, we'll let you guys go get some dinner, or get settled in your Airbnb, and then we should yeah. uh, find a place to go to dinner tonight. Let's do that. Sunday in Kalispell, not great options. Yeah. Pizza so Hut. we're we're not doing that. We can do better than pizza. Okay. Hut. Okay. I believe you. We'll see what happens. Like Papa John's, it's more of a bespoke pizza that's experience. That's. We'll see what happens. What do you want to close it with? Up to you. Um. Look, I, 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 I want people to remain optimistic about the future of our country because I think as Americans, the benefit we have is um, we are freedom-loving human beings, and that's what makes America great. America is not great because of the politicians that, that run policy. It's not great because of the, um, the governors and the mayors or the sheriffs and the, and the chiefs. It's great because of the people. Uh, I want people to remain optimistic because... That is the fabric of the nation that's going to hold shit together when things fall apart. There will be fringe actors on both sides that do dumb shit, but the moderates where I am, where I lie, where my family lies, will be okay. Boom. Boom. Till next time. Peace out.